Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Aquay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, Sophia Smallstorm returns to the show. Our discussion is based on Sophia's recent newsletter where she offers her insights into a small Brazilian jungle tribe known as the Piraha, whose culture is very different than ours. We then discuss whether the human heart is really a pump and if our voices are more than a communication vehicle. Sophia's newsletters are subscriber-based, so please visit her website at sophiasmallstorm.com for details on subscribing. And so without further ado, here's Sophia. Well, Sophia, welcome back to another Sage Equay Hour radio show. And um, you sent me your December-January newsletter, which I always find very, very fascinating. And in this last newsletter, you cover three topics. You cover some folks that live in the Amazon that live very differently than any of us would ever imagine. You also talk about the heart. Perhaps it's not a pump like we've always been taught. And also that our voices, they're more than just a communication vehicle, that there's something more to speaking. I found all three topics within the newsletter to be fascinating. And I thought maybe we can start with the people out of the Amazon. And let me see, make sure I'm pronouncing this correctly. The Piraha? Yeah, Piraha. It's a Brazilian word for these people who live um, right near the Maisi River, which is an Amazonian tributary. Now, the Amazon starts in the Peruvian Andes, and it flows all the way across Brazil. And I'll tell you something, that is the river of rivers. These tributaries are all different colors. They have different kinds of water. Some of the Amazon is colored like chocolate milk. That's the, It's not polluted or anything. That's the way it flows. And the critters that live in the Amazon, Amazonian jungle are really pretty amazing. What we have to think about, first of all, I have to thank you for inviting me back, Mike. What am I thinking? How rude of me. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> to let you know that this newsletter, actually the three subjects you mentioned, there are a few more woven in between them, but these three subjects I believe are connected, and I attempted to do so in this double issue. It took me a double issue because there was just too much, too much to describe and get through and connect. But I was very taken by this um, pre-tool tribe called the Piraha in Brazil. And I stumbled upon this um, Piraha culture because I was reading an article in Harper's Magazine by Tom Wolfe. And this is, I believe, the Tom Wolfe who wrote um, Bonfire of the Vanities, you know, the famous writer Tom Wolfe. But anyway, Tom Wolfe has delved into linguistics and language. And I had always been interested in linguistics because of some of Noam Chomsky's work. Noam Chomsky said that language is hardwired into us, but not just language, grammar is hardwired into us. Grammar is a structural tool, a structural thing in the brain. It's innate, meaning that the way people construct speech all across the world is very, very similar. It is all, um, it's like a, a, a thing that you build speech. It has this component called recursion. Recursion just means one thought in another, in another, in another. So if I say, you know, the book I lent you last year, I don't think you've returned it to me yet. That is recursion. It means I lent you a book last year, Mike. This year, that book isn't here in my, among my possessions. You must not have returned it to me yet. There are different components having to do with different periods of time. And I have kind of just harnessed and gathered them all and made one sentence. Well, Chomsky decided that this is universal. It's all over the world. But guess what? It isn't. Because this one little tribe in the Amazon doesn't use recursion. They speak in very simple sentences, each having to do with one event only. Okay, so they keep it very short and simple then. Yeah, they have no words for the distant past or the future. They barely refer to yesterday and tomorrow, and they simply call them the other day. 
They never speak of grandparents, great-grandparents, relatives from the past. They don't tell fictional stories. They don't speak of, they have no creation myth. They don't have the grammar of the future or the past. And they speak in these singular sentences. So everything is in the now? Yeah. Okay. I call them masters of the now. So they would say, I don't have the book. I gave you the book. I don't have it. That's how they would say, the book that I lent you has not yet been returned by you. They would never refer to a year ago because they don't count. They have no counting. Okay, very interesting. They have reference for a lot and a little. But now this doesn't mean that they're stupid because in their referentials, they talk about, like if you showed them a group of pebbles, they would refer to the small ones and the big ones. They would separate them out by size. And they there are ways to say the small ones, the big ones, but they won't be able to tell you three, six, nine. They wouldn't lump them all together. So they have they have their own cultural way of perceiving life, and it is all about the present. So in the pebble situation or the pebble example, uh, Sophia, what you're saying is, is that they're not counting, but they can separate based upon what they perceive as quantity. In other words, is a number of large pebbles is a number of small pebbles, or, or are they not doing that either? They're doing that, but they're not counting the individual pebbles. They don't have a way of quantifying them. Okay. So they were discovered by missionaries. And the challenge of the missionaries was to, of course, convert them to Christianity. But nobody succeeded. They had resisted conversion to Christianity for a long time, a couple of centuries. And this young missionary by the name of Daniel Everett, he was actually born in Holtville, California, which is near San Diego, he wound up at 26 years old in the Amazon with his very young family with the task of converting the Piraha to Christianity. But first he had to learn their language. And I mean, you can't, you can't convert someone. You can't teach religion if you can't talk to them, right? Right. So he, his, his goal was to translate the Bible into Piraha. That was his long-term goal. But he had to learn the language first. It was a very odd language. It has only three vowels, A, O, and I, A, O, and E. That's how they pronounce them. And then eight consonants, seven of which women use, and eight are used by men. So P, T, B, G, S, H, K, and X. So Piraha is the smallest and leanest language known. And the Piraha are also illiterate. They, if you show them a two-tone black and white photograph, they will not be able to tell what it is. They don't even see. They can't, two dimensions are a whole foreign concept to them. This is what interests me about them, right? So if you show them a picture, they wouldn't be able to, to see that picture or pick up any details? Not in black and white. They can follow color and movies, video and footage, film footage better, but they think it's really happening. They don't understand. They have no concept of acting, that this is a story. This is fictional. If you show them a movie, they think that you have a periscope into something that's really going on. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And they live completely in the present. They do not make tools. They... Do, they weave these little temporary baskets out of jungle stuff, reeds, to carry temporarily, but they don't last, and they'll never use them more than maybe twice. And while they use dugout canoes that they trade Brazil nuts for because there are river traders, the Amazon is a place of business. It's really amazing when you learn more about it, but there are these traders that come down the river and they um, uh, trade certain goods for, you know, like manufactured goods for jungle hardwoods, Brazil nuts, things like that. And the Piraha will gather Brazil nuts and trade them for dugout canoes. And um, Dan, while he was with them, he's been with them 30 years. He's now a full-fledged professor, uh, professor of linguistics at um, 
a, I am not remembering the university, but anyway, he has written a best-selling book about the Piraha called Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, which is the Piraha's way of saying good night. They don't sleep for very long. They kind of snooze and nap. Because of the dangers of the Amazon, there's always a possibility. Since they don't have furniture and they sleep on the ground, they don't even string up hammocks, as far as I understand. They cannot sleep for long. And they very much live in the now. So if one of them is out fishing and brings home fish in the middle of the night, the rest of them will wake up and eat the fish. They live in small communities along this part of the um, river, the Maisi. And um, Everett was absolutely struck by how they spoke. The fact that they had, once he began to learn it, there's very, what seems like a limited way of communicating. But one thing to remember is when you only have three vowels and eight consonants, you don't have a lot of flexibility in making words. Your Like English has um, 26 letters. We've got a bunch of vowels. We've got a whole lot more consonants. And then we have combined consonants like ch and the and sh and you know what I mean? Yeah. So we have many ways to formulate short words. We have all kinds of combinations we can make, like bug and glug and mug. And then we can go into bog and slog and dog. I mean, how many words do we have? And they can be short and they're each definitive. Plus we have slang. Right. But once you have, and you have long multisyllabic words as well, but when you have a language with only three vowels and eight consonants, your words have to become combinations of those, and they have to become longer and longer and longer and longer, right? Think about it, in order to be different. So the Piraha have in their own way a complex language, but what's really amazing about it is <laughs> there's no past and there's no future. They live today. Yeah, I found that to be very, very intriguing because it's almost impossible for us, let's just say Western society, to just live in the present, in the now, today. We're always thinking in terms of the future and we're thinking back to the past and then we think back to the future. That's one of the reasons why people make a, a business out of being mindful, like mindfulness, right? And then when I was reading your newsletter, I'm thinking, well, these people have mindfulness down cold. This is how they live. Right. I mean, you have to also remind yourself that they're living, they're pretty fulfilled in their way of living. The Amazon gives them fish. They can hunt. They have some small dogs. They use a bow and arrow, but that's it. And they're very good with it. So they... Um, have their dugouts that they trade for. They don't need their dugout canoes. And when they were taught how to make a dugout canoe, they actually made a nice one, but they never wanted to make them again. They would prefer to trade Brazil nuts for dugout canoes rather than learn how to make their own canoes. This is just a cultural preference. It's like me. I don't want to know how to change the oil in my car. I just don't want to do it. I would rather pay somebody else to do it. So you would do it once, you did it, then you say, well, you know what, I'm not interested in changing my oil anymore, right? I wouldn't even do it once. <laughs> I was trying to use an example, but a bad one, I guess. <laughs> All right, no, I understand. So the Piraha are, are people of the present. They Look, they don't count. So what's the point? The Brazilian government doesn't try to charge them for the land they roam around on. It doesn't impose taxes on them. They have no money. They don't want money. They can't count. So uniform commercial code would be meaningless to them. And they're left alone. The Brazilian government leaves them alone, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because, and I think it's because they can't count. What's the point of trying to get them to pay fines and taxes if they don't, they can't count. Everett tried to teach them to count. They asked him, teach us this thing that you do. He spent eight months. They couldn't learn it. But now what we can't get is what they do with humming speech. 
So I've put some videos on my blog. You have to scroll down now, sophiasmallstorm.com, and then you scroll down and you'll find the um, Piraha posts with Dan Everett. But there are also some more instructive videos that he has made about how to learn languages. Very interesting if you have any interest at all in languages, as I do. Now, Dan, apart from trying to teach them to count, noticed that the Piraha, and there's an instance shown in one of those videos, the Piraha can just hum to each other. So they can go, and that's as good as saying something. They understand perfectly what that means. They won't whisper because whispering doesn't carry tones and pitch. And so they have what's called a tonal language that relies on pitch, as we do in some ways in English. But we can whisper because our words are distinct enough without vocalization. Animals do the tonal thing, though, right? Like I know my dog Charlie, he'll go through tones to communicate. Yeah, and in fact, there's a part, I'm reading Everett's book, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, and if I'm very ambitious, I might buy the book that he wrote for linguists as well, um, which is more complex. But the the Piraha were the subject of a documentary as well made by an Australian film crew, and I bought that. I just want to warn anyone that the shipping is extraordinarily expensive. You have to buy it from Australia and they charged a lot for shipping it to the United States. But anyway, I haven't watched it yet. It's a highly recommended video by um, Everett himself, although he wasn't part of making it. He is in it. But surprisingly and enviably, that video, that documentary is titled The Grammar of Happiness, because these Piraha are joyful, smiling people. If a misfortune occurs, like if they lose something or the, they do make these little lean-tos to shelter under when it's raining. And if the wind blows it down, they just laugh. They make another one. They do not rue death. They consider that when somebody is dying, it's completely normal. In fact, they have a very weird cultural position from what I gathered from this book on death. If somebody is struggling with a, you know, terrible disease or there was a mother who was giving birth on the banks of the river and it was a breech birth and she was in great pain and she was calling out to them. She was a Piraha herself for help and they wouldn't help her and she and the baby died. So this to me, to us, it would be very anomalous and weird, you know. But they do help each other in other instances. There's something they have around sickness and death where they don't start getting all, you know, teary and uh, and freaked out. They let people and animals die. And, um, for instance, there's another story in the book of the Piraha do not do well with alcohol. And this is their Achilles heel, as one we've discovered with North American Indians and I guess you you give them alcohol and they don't tolerate it well and then they get really um you know fearsomely worked up. So Dan was the subject of a a, a premeditated attack by his own little village of Pirahas that he was staying with because some river trader came gave them really cheap crappy alcohol and talked them into killing him. And so they all conspired to kill him because they were the rip-roaring drunk. And he managed to thwart this, his own murder, and they apologized to him later when they were sober. But the Piraha are, um, uh, I was t going to tell another story about drunkenness. Well, I mean, I, I guess they woke up the next morning and were like, you know, hey, Dan, no hard feelings about last night. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In fact, one of the stories that you have uh, that you can read in the book is that one Piraha, you know, they have their small dogs, their beloved little dogs. And uh, by the way, here's a very interesting thing about the dogs. We're talking too much about them. We'll never get to all the other stuff. But they're so interesting. They do not mind sharing um, their food with dogs while they're eating because they don't have a belief in germs. 
So they're not averse and their dogs are helpers to them. So they can, you and I would probably not share plates of food with like Charlie, right? You right. might give him the plate to lick. Some people do that later. Yeah, but he's not going to sit down and share that. Right. Right. But the Piraha will share whatever they catch, the fish they catch with their dogs. So now they do care about their dogs, obviously. Dogs are considered part of the team. So one very drunken Piraha was annoyed by the barking of his brother's dog. And he simply got up and shot the dog. I guess they do use guns that they've traded for. So he shoots his brother's beloved little dog. The brother just picks up the dog and cries. And Dan says to the brother, well, aren't you going to do something? Your brother just shot your dog. Don't you want to, you know, hurt him? And the Piraha said, no, he's drunk the fire water. He doesn't understand. I'm not going to hurt my brother. Yeah. And that was that. Yeah. You know, when I was reading uh, the article, I, I was struggling with, are they primitive? Or would they view us as primitive? The the knee-jerk reaction would be that we are more advanced. But, you know, that's just a knee-jerk reaction because you have to think in terms of the simplicity of their life. It appears that they don't have a lot of disease. They're, they're able to, uh, to feed themselves without a problem. They don't seem to have mood swings other than when his brother's dog is barking too much. They seem to be very even-keeled and steady people. I mean, did I get the right message from the newsletter about these folks? Yeah, they're happy. This is why the film was called The Grammar of Happiness. And the only reason that guy objected to the barking of the dog was that he was drunk. He was drunk. Yeah, yeah. The Piraha, they're up at all hours of the night. They don't sleep except for short periods of time. They talk all the time. They're constantly talking at loud voices. They would occupy Dan's um, structure that he lived in with hammocks. They occupied it like it was theirs. It's weird to think about just waking up every day and just being very focused. I can't even say very focused because it's all they know is right now. It's it's very hard to fathom that somebody could not think in terms of the future, doing something in the future. Well, here's why, Mike. When you live in a place where all your needs are met and you don't have ambitions that exceed what is offered by your by the present in your surroundings, you don't need to talk about the future. You don't need to make arrangements. I mean, look at our society. I was thinking about this. All right. I don't grow my own food. I have to go and buy it somewhere. I if I want, you know, my toilet fixed. I mean, I could learn to do it myself. But if I have to call a plumber, I have to do make arrangements for the future. I mean, the deliveries, the complexity of our interlocking world requires planning and strategizing in order for things to happen. And especially to happen on time. And we trade money for things. I mean, I have to have money ready to pay someone to come and do something or to go and buy my food. I cannot go to the store and pick up food and say, you know, well, I'll pay you tomorrow. We have other ways of doing that, credit cards and whatnot. But our entire society is built on on arrangements. It's built on and out of arrangements which involve past and future, right? Theirs isn't. It's just very mind-boggling to think about how they they go about their day, because it's just so it's so different. I mean, it's diametrically opposed to our culture. Now I contrast the way they live with um, a settlement that I have a book about. One of the people who was part of this settlement, they were Mennonites, and they were plopped down in the jungles of Paraguay. When this particular writer, this is from the book Furies, an autobiography by Ingrid Rimland, written in 1984. And I really was taken with this part of the book. It's at the very beginning. So these Mennonites who are from Europe, they have to live in South America. And Paraguay jungles got to be quite a bit like the jungle in Brazil. And they couldn't wait to 
tear the jungle brush down and build straight roads. And they had ox carts with wheels. They had horses. They baked bread. They cooked food in tin cans. They planted geraniums and roses. And they hated the jungle. They couldn't stand the the mosquitoes and all the bites they were getting. I remember um, that the beds that they slept in, their legs had to be put in cans of kerosene because creepy crawlies would come out, deadly spiders in the middle of the night and bite you. And, you know, the Pirha, what I started to think about was that their skin, when you have dark skin, melanin is a biopolymer, and biopolymers are structural materials. Polymers are long chain molecules. So melanin makes your skin thick and robust. It also has a, an ability to transform ultraviolet radiation into thermal radiation. So it protects you against sunburn. Now, when you're really white, lily white, and you're dropped down somewhere in an equatorial region, you cannot handle this much sun and your skin is thinner. It's weaker. It doesn't have the same kind of biopolymer. Um, um, augmentation to it, and it's sensitive to heat and bug bites. The pirahas don't even notice mosquitoes. They don't sweat. They can exert themselves and they don't even sweat. And white people are pouring sweat. They're constantly having to hydrate themselves. They, the littlest mosquito bite is going to cause a big old welt, you know? So, we are really meant to live in certain latitudes that befit our biology. The Piraha similarly living in, we were talking about the crazy jungle that they live in with, I mean, Everett saw when he was in his motorboat on um, the river, a 40 foot anaconda. Yeah. 40 feet wider than his body rearing up out of the water. Now that kind of, predation and those kinds of dangers and threats from things like poison dart frogs to these deadly spiders. I mean, there are blood sucking animals. When you live where there's that much life, where the world is teeming with life, it is a competitive predatory uh, life group, right? An environment that's predatory. Yeah. Right. So the people who, acclimated to higher latitudes, lost the structural components of their skin. They had to start planning. They had to start planning to overcome the um, challenges of cold weather. They had to make buildings. They had to figure out how to keep themselves warm. I mean, all of this kind of lifestyle requires thinking and strategizing for the future. So I think the language, that, that grammatical component comes out of what you're facing around you. If you don't have anything but direct present time threats, you're going to speak in the language of the present. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I, you know, when I, again, when I was reading the, uh, the newsletter, the thought that ran through my mind is, uh, are we getting a glimpse into how humans, all humans, used to exist how we used to be and then of course over time we've evolved into you know what we have today um even though the piraha their their way of life seems so so foreign to us i mean that was the thought that crossed my mind did we all start that way i don't know well yeah there's something called the box saga if you google it um or look for it on youtube and you watch a movie called welcome to hell h-e-l that all life started at the North Pole. Now, if you're a flat earther, that yeah. makes sense because the North Pole is central. And that's where the sun would have been when the sun started. So everything started. Remember, we ourselves have been taught that Greenland was green and there was tremendous fertility where we now have ice. But um, if it all started then, in the Bok Saga, they say that everybody was dark-skinned. Yeah, it's interesting. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to, um, to get a, a glimpse into uh, a culture, a lifestyle and existence the way they live. It, it, it really, really is. I mean, we were joking before the call and I said, there's absolutely no way I, I would make my way down there and even contemplate or consider living that type of lifestyle. But, you know, but I was thinking to myself, but, you know, 
did we, humans, as humans, many, many moons ago, actually live that way? Well, Mike, you did. You had a loincloth, maybe a bow and arrow. You didn't count, and you were happy. How's that? I would think that that's true. You know, we had to start someplace. So did you want to... um to talk more about the uh, Piraha, Sophia, or did you want to move to the uh, the next segment of your newsletter, which uh, has to do with uh, the heart? I want to just throw this in because it's important. Okay. The Piraha do not call themselves the Piraha. They call themselves the straight heads. Yes, yes, versus the crooked heads, right? Everybody else is the crooked heads. I haven't really figured out why they have created these designations, but this is the what they use. And, you know, when... Everett learned enough Piraha to start asking them about creation myths and telling them about Jesus. They really didn't want to talk about it. They asked him, so Jesus, how tall is he? And he said, well, I don't really know. What's his hair like? Well, we don't know what his hair was like. And the Piraha just said, look, if you did you know him? He, and he said, no. Did your father know him? No, my father didn't know him. Well, you know, Dan, you're our friend, but we, if you don't know anybody that knew this Jesus, then please don't tell us any more about him because we don't want to talk about him. So that's where they are. They don't want to discuss anything that somebody they know has not had direct experience of. Either they have to have the direct experience or somebody they know has to have it. That To them, that's how you verify. That's how you document. But if nobody has had any direct experience, they don't want to waste the time talking about it. Yeah, no hearsay. So did you want to move to the, um, did you want to go into the heart segment? Yes. How would you like to set that up? Since you read the newsletter, I hope you read it many times. I did. I did. I always read the newsletter when I, I do these shows all the time, because otherwise I would be ill prepared and I'm never ill prepared. No, it, it was just interesting to me because I remember you and I talking about this before you had actually finished the uh, the newsletter. And you had said, you know, my the, the heart is not a pump. And I remember thinking to myself, what does she mean it's not a pump? Because that's all we've ever been taught, that your heart is the, the vehicle, the mechanism, the organ in your body that ensures that your blood flows through your body. And so when I got to your newsletter, it got very interesting. So maybe if you want to pick it up from there and explain why it is, it's not a pump. The heart, first of all, is composed of smooth muscle. And this is my take on it to start with, makes it easy. Now, you've got two kinds of muscle in your body. You've got smooth and striated. So smooth muscle is the tissue that makes up organs. Like your intestines are smooth muscle. Your heart is smooth muscle. Striated muscle would be like your biceps and other muscles that do actual physical work, right? Right. So if the heart is not striated muscle, but it's smooth muscle, how can it possibly pump blood and with each beat get blood that supposedly gets all the way down to your toes and goes up? You have two aortas. I wasn't even aware of this till recently. You have an ascending aorta coming out of the top of the heart, which feeds oxygenated blood to your upper body and brain. And then you have the descending aorta, which branches into other arteries like renal, iliac, femoral, and feeds those those branches of your body, right? The two legs and the lower part, the torso. So the heart has smooth muscle. How does it possibly go boom, 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 and get blood all the way from where it is down to your toes? How how can it do that? Even Leonardo da Vinci did drawings of this. That the if you look at embryonic life forms, you will notice that they are receiving blood flow, experiencing blood flow, and the heart isn't even made yet, right? Yep. So pre-heart, blood can flow. And if you look at the mechanics of the heart, uh, it's at the very destination point, which is your – picture it in terms of your extremities, the blood – 
the oxygenated blood has to be taken all the way to the cells in your toes and it feeds all the cells everywhere else as well. But th at that point, it actually almost stops and that's where it exchanges through osmotic absorption, gases and wastes and nutrients. There's a swap that goes on because the walls of the cell are semi permeable. So it almost stops and then it picks up a new load, a new cargo, and it has to continue again. Now it has to go all the way back through your venous system to veins, to your lungs, to be oxygenated again, right? So how is that possible? It's really, really strange to think that your heart, like this broom, can just get the blood going and make it go everywhere, and then it stops, it picks up a new load, and it comes back. So what... um these um, people, the heart is not a pump, a refutation of the pressure propulsion premise of heart function by Marinelli et Alia. And it's at a website called etherforce.com. That is spelled A-E-T-H-E-R, force, F-O-R-C-E dot com. So this paper explains the electrical activity of the heart. The heart actually is electrically charging blood, and the blood is spinning out of the aorta in a spiral. And it is then, this is my take on it, it is that spiraling blood as it hits the arterial lining called the endothelium, it is recharged. Every time it hits, it's recharged, 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 and that's how it travels. Now, what is this electrical energy called? This is my take. Now, I have no degrees, and I could be dead wrong, but this is how I have explained it to myself for now. The electrical energy in this charging system is called piezoelectricity. And piezoelectricity operates throughout our body and throughout biology and throughout the geology of the world. Piezoelectricity is the original wireless electricity, and it involves the exchange through a crystal medium of frequency with the result of voltage being generated. So when you hit a crystal with a frequency, it will generate a voltage. When you hit a crystal with a voltage, it will generate a frequency. And in the case of the cells that line your arteries, these endothelial cells, cells, as we know from the work of Gerald Pollock, P-O-L-L-O-C-K, the cytoplasm of the cell, which is the, if you picture an egg, the yolk is the nucleus, the egg white is the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is water-based. It's really the greater part of the cell in terms of size and volume and mass. The cytoplasm, the water in there, is electrically structured. It is electrically charged. It's a structured water. It's not just any old water. And because it's structured, it is crystalline in nature. So when that spiraling blood comes out of the heart into the aorta and it hits those cells in the endothelium that are crystalline. So the motion of the blood is a mechanical force or a pressure, which is also known as a frequency. When it hits those cells in the endothelium, which are crystalline, voltage is generated. So the movement of the blood generates voltage for the blood to Keep moving. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And also in the newsletter, which I found uh, very intriguing, was you had written that the blood vessels, they are tubular, right? The way they are configured, they are spiraled tubes. And that spiraling effect is what sends the blood, I guess, in a, a kind of a vortex type of movement. And that's what also helps it to to keep it flowing through the body. Did I get that right? Now, this is very complicated for me to understand, but everything in nature is a, is built from a helix or spiral. Tubules are, are hollow constructions of their fibers themselves, and they're built in a spiraling form, and they're hollow inside, and they make other things. 
consider your bones being tubules that are, they're not straight. There's no straight line in nature. They, everything is a twisted strut, a helix. Leaves are slightly, they're made of fibers that are twisted. Branches of trees are twisted. Your bones are twisted. Just look at them. You can see that there's a curve to bones, right? And they're, they've got crystalline materials in them. And inside the bone, you are making bone marrow. So there's, in all these tubules and fibers in nature, stuff is going on inside. New forms of biology are being, um, made and nurtured. So the biochemist Mark Krasno, he's at Stanford University. He is the one who has uh, made known that the Creation of our organs, our kidneys, our lungs, it all comes from tubules. Everything in our body begins as a tubule or fiber. And so this spiral, tubular, fibrous, hollow, vorticular geometry of biology, biological life, and the fact that the blood flows in that way as well, it's all... It's a vorticular spiraling flow. Everything about life is about the spiral and about motion that is registered as frequency that generates voltage. So what is life? It is the generation, the exchange of electricity on the cellular level. It depends on electricity being generated by itself. And what generates electricity? Motion. Motion is pressure frequency. That's the ground rule of piezoelectric effect. So when I talk to you, I am creating a frequency. It's a sound wave, right? Right. It's being received by the cells of your body. A part of it is being transformed by your auditory receptors. It's being fed to your brain as information. It's making the in inner ear vibrate same with music it's going into your brain but it's received by all of your body and it ultimately this is my little two cent theory it charges you when i talk to you when listeners hear this show they are becoming electrically charged by the sound waves this is why we talk why do people talk to themselves when they live alone why do people sing to themselves yeah, so this goes to the, the third part of your newsletter, which says that the voice is more than just a communication vehicle, that there's actually a, uh, I guess, a, a biological function to the voice. There's an electrical effect generated by the exchange of conversation and sound between two people, even between animals. Yeah. It could be an explanation as to why when you speak to certain people, you enjoy speaking to them, right? Because their voice, I guess, uh, maybe their voice is appealing, uh, whatever it may be. And then there's other people whose voices do not resonate with you. Everybody's had that experience, right? Right. And this is where I would bring in, now this is again my little two cent contribution, the autonomic nervous system. So... Part of our nervous system is called the ANS, autonomic nervous system, and that has two branches, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic nervous system is relaxation. It's sleep, digestion. It's calm, peace. It's feeling rich and settled and full and fulfilled. And it promotes certain biological activities. The sympathetic nervous system is Adrenaline, epinephrine, fight, flight, fear, be alert, get ready to move, shallow breathing, constantly poised to do battle or do something that requires a burst of energy. So you're not at rest when your SNS is triggered. And what's happening to us in our world with the enormous amount of stress that we place on one another and these like the, you know, the Piraha, they don't have to worry about what happens in other countries because it doesn't really affect them in the way that they live their lives, right? But we're constantly on the internet. We're worried about, well, what is Trump going to do? Or what are the, what is, what's ISIS going to do? And so this causes us unrest. It fires up the sympathetic nervous system, as does conversation with people whom we worry about or dislike or suspect 
effect. That is all triggering the sympathetic nervous system. There are frequencies that, you know, are sublingual. And there's a lingual component as well that uh, sublinguistic. I don't know which is the right word. But that's how we get pushed one way or the other. We, I, somebody makes us feel good because they're communicating care and concern and love and things that we, we find inspiring and and comforting, or they make us feel bad. Is that a good enough explanation? Yeah, no, it's a really good explanation. And what I was thinking, because all this stuff, I think in terms of well, how is this plugged in at a bigger picture, right? So we, with music as an example, you mentioned music. So a lot of the music today is really, uh, most people would say, well, at least our age, it's, it's unbearable. Being a musician myself, I can tell you that a lot of the music today is really, really very rough. I mean, as far as uh, the sound, it is no melody. It's not melodic. Um, there's really no tune to speak of. And so you had mentioned the SNS, that it was the flight or fight type of response. So could it be that the music that's out there today, Sophia, not all music, but a lot of the pop music, as an example, I'm talking about rap, uh, metal music, that type of thing there, where it is designed to rile people up, to put them in that fight or flight type of behavior pattern. Does that make sense? Absolutely, Mike. The music under contract with the recording industry is dark, worrisome music. It's yeah. vibrations and its frequencies and its tones and its rhythms run counter to the parasympathetic nervous system. They do not allow you to relax. They cause you to be on edge. And the sad thing is there's a generation of youth becoming acclimated to this. Yeah. I yeah. see kids, I've said this on shows before, they are next to me at a stoplight and they're listening to this unearthly diabolical music and I can see their position. They're sitting tensed in the driver's seat and their heads are, everything about them is tensed and this to them is music. Yeah. It's incredible. It is incredible. And it's, you know, every time we talk about these types of topics, you know, I know that I circle back a lot of times to a bigger picture, an agenda, and somebody would say it was just conspiratorial. But I'm mean, even going back to the heart as an example. Every doctor, if you go to a cardiologist or you go to ha have a uh, heart surgery, they're going to treat that heart like a pump. That's how they're going to treat it. I guess the question becomes, because I'm sure people are asking this question as they're listening to us, is, well, if the heart is not a pump, but it is beating, what exactly is it doing then? If it's not a pump, then what is it doing? It's providing voltage to the blood. It's a, it's a battery. So it's giving a charge to the blood. Right. And in that same paper, they actually explain that the blood itself is charging the heart. So this whole trade-off, this is the piezoelectric nugget, is that frequencies produce voltages and voltages produce frequencies. So this would explain then, uh, because there are going to be folks saying, well, there's heart transplants. Uh, if your heart s stops beating, you're going to die. But what's really happening is when your heart stops beating is that that reciprocating charge ceases, and that is what stops the flow of blood going through the body. Right. If that electric electricity, if that electrical charge stops, when you have cardiac arrest, what is the first thing the medics do? They put electrical paddles on you and they give you a big shock. Now, in the conventional interpretation of that, that shock jolts the heart, physically goes, hey, get in, start moving again, right? Yeah, yeah. But what is it? It, they're conferring electricity into the heart, and now that they're charging the blood, and they're hoping that the system gets going again. This electrical charging system, it's like jump-starting your car, charging your battery, right? You don't give a physical wallop to the battery in your car when you put jumper cables from somebody else's battery, right? Right, right. Now, do you think that medical doctors, let's say heart surgeons as an example, cardiologists, do you think that they are aware of uh, the heart not being a pump or that they actually believe it's a pump? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think they think it's a pump. 
This is what their culture teaches them, their medical culture. And you know what? If they want to think that, they can think that. But this article from um, Marinelli et al. says that it is a very big danger that they are doing um, research based on this erroneous belief. And they're spending how many dollars? And they're going down the wrong path. Well, that's like with a lot of things. And that's what I was just thinking is, is that uh, all this money and this research is being invested into an area where this is not how it works, but we're going to invest enormous amounts of resources and money into something that is a fallacy. And it, it, what it does is it just perpetuates, um, the whole, I guess it perpetuates the whole control mechanism, right? I mean, it's a way of not revealing the true nature of our biology, the true nature of our bodies, the true nature of how we function, and so on. And by not revealing that and keeping that under wraps, you're always, always going to be at a disadvantage. Always. Right. I'm going to read to you from the introduction of this paper. The heart, an organ weighing about 300 grams. Think how little that is. Yeah. It's supposed to pump 8,000 liters of blood a day at rest, and much more during activity. When you're running or playing tennis or jumping around, it's more than 8,000 liters of blood. If you spend, if like triathletes, eight hours a day exercising, consider the load on their hearts. So in terms of mechanical work, this represents the lifting of approximately 100 pounds one mile high. In terms of capillary flow, the heart is performing an even more prodigious task of forcing the blood with a viscosity five times greater than that of water. So blood is much thicker than water. Through millions of capillaries with diameters often smaller than the red blood cells themselves. Clearly, such claims go beyond reason and imagination. The concept of a centralized pressure source, i.e. the heart, generating excessive pressure at its source so that sufficient pressure remains at the remote capillaries is not an elegant one. That's their way of saying it doesn't, doesn't fly. Yeah. Now they say the impact of spending billions of dollars on cardiovascular research using an erroneous premise is enormous. In relation to this, the efforts to construct a satisfactory artificial heart have yet to bear fruit. Within the confines of contemporary biological and medical thinking, the propulsive force of the blood remains a mystery. If the heart really does not furnish the blood with its total motive force, where is the source of the auxiliary force and what is its true nature? The answer to these questions will foster a new understanding of the phenomena of life in the biological sciences and enable physicians to rediscover the human being. Well, there you go. I mean, that's really the thread I was on. I'm glad you read that because it was probably a lot more succinct and made more sense than me. But, wow. I mean, it's just another another avenue, another place where we're being misled. And in a big way, right? I, I, we all know that the medical business and, and so on, I mean, it, it we don't really have the, the best medical care. I mean, we have the best medical care based upon what it is that they want us to believe about that care. But when I say we're not getting the best care, what I mean is is uh, alternative methods and alternative uh, research and science and so on that is completely not talked about, not talked about at all. It just uh, reinforces to me, Sophia, that there's just so much subversion. There's just so much that is kept from us. It's mind-boggling and it's very disconcerting, but that's why we do these shows, right? We do these shows so that we can get some of these ideas and these, these thoughts out there and uh, to get people to think and to start asking questions versus just accepting whatever it is that's fed to them. Mike, we have a medical system that applies intervention when we seek it. In some instances, it's forced on us. Like if you pass out and the paramedics come and you put in an ambulance, taken to a hospital, by the time you gain, regain consciousness, they have already possibly stuck you with needles and they're applying their interventions. This is under, in the guise of saving your life. 
they're good at certain interventions. They really are. I mean, if right. you have a terrible break of your femur, they can set it and make sure that it heals well. Whereas if you were out in the woods with the Piraha, you might limp for the rest of your life, right? Or be left to die because their philosophy is, you know what? Shit happens. Yeah. So, oops, am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so the modern methodology is to get you roped into their system with a beginning intervention of one kind or another, which could be treatment for a disease, treatment notice, not a cure. And then you're going to stumble along because the interventions they are introducing into your body are going to create a uh, brother and sister issues. So there's going to be a continued uh, trajectory of breakdown that you will experience, and you will then become dependent on them and their solutions and ideas and further interventions. Isn't it just mind-numbing, though, when – Ever you step into a hospital, let's say you're going to visit, you know, somebody who's sick in the hospital, a friend or a family member. It's almost overwhelming to take in the magnitude of what's there. Technology, machines, resources, people, and so on. I mean, it's just amazing to me that the whole Western medicine, they've built a behemoth and they've got everybody Believing, well, just about everybody believing that the buck stops there. You know, that uh, they're the kingpins, that they know better. Uh, they have this, this science down pat, and uh, there's no better way. You know, it, it always amazes me whenever I step into a hospital and I start, I take it a step back, you know, and I'm just taking a look at everything that's going on, everything, right down to the person who's keeping records, the person processing insurance, and so on, you know. The nurse comes out, they have a little pre-talk with you, and they take you to another room. And then there's, there's rooms with all this very expensive technology and these machines and so on, you know. And then, you know, and then there's the, the prescriptions that follow after that. You have to be on this prescription and that prescription, you know. Make sure you take your medicine and so on. It's, it's just really, sometimes it's very difficult to get my head wrapped around where this whole thing is at. Well, Mike, it's a business. There is a great book by a doctor called Sandeep Johar, J-A-U-H-A-R. He's from India originally, and he works now at Long Island Jewish Medical Center. And the book is doctored with an E-D on the end. And this book describes his recognition to his dismay and regret of the business of medicine. And this is where the breakdown occurs in this very commercial profit driven system of modern medicine through the hospital um, hub. And even doctor's offices must be profit driven. They must be making money. They must double and triple book patients and roll them in and out. They have very high malpractice. They have insurance. Um, they have all kinds of, uh, you know, obligations, financial obligations, including really nasty loans to pay for med school. And so they are caught in that system. I did an interview with Dr. Jennifer Daniels, the second one on my podcast page about the sky.com podcast. And she explains this very, very well as someone who was a practicing physician in America herself. But what I want to get um, into right now is that the transfer of electricity also occurs through human touch, not just through the voice. So when you're not feeling well and somebody lays their hands on you, you're actually receiving what is construed as a healing energy. And I'm not trying to be new age about this or woo woo or anything like that, but Dr. Mercola did an interview with a guy called Thomas Cowan, C-O-W-A-N, who is also an MD, and he is aware that the heart is not a pump. He is aware of the electrical um, charging of the blood. He explains it differently than I explained it here because 
maybe they're talking about the same thing as I am. I don't know. But I tried to make it possible for me and you and listeners to understand in my own way. But at any rate, he says that we receive electrical charge which pushes our entire biology, and that has to do with this concept of electron transfer, which can be gotten from grounding, earthing, walking on the earth. Um, we get it through touching. Why do people cuddle their little dogs and cats and love to, why does the dog love to sleep in bed with you under the covers? Because you are a source of electrons for him and vice versa. And I'll tell you something, if we were sleeping on the ground on the earth, we wouldn't need that much touch with each other and chatting and talking, although the Pirahar are constantly doing it. But the Pirahar are sitting with their bare butts on the ground, their bare foot, they are in bright sunlight. They are getting photonic electron transfer. They are getting electron transfer through voice, through the ground, the river. These people are fed, fully fed with recharging energy for their biology, which is why they are happy. Why are we not happy? Because we live in artificial light. We're cut off from the ground. We don't touch each other. We talk by email. And we're completely dissociated from the very most powerful sources of electrons. I can uh, vouch for the whole touch aspect of it because, as you know, um, Sophia, I'm a Reiki master, and Reiki is the same thing as Chi and also Prana. There's no doubt in my mind, and for the people that I do the Reiki for, that they can actually feel the flow of energy going through their body when it's a Reiki session and they will, many times it will lull them into almost going to sleep in a very, very deep trance state. And then when they wake up after the session, let's say it's 45 minutes or so, clients will feel very, very relaxed and very at ease, very calm. Nobody has to convince me that touch is very important. It absolutely is. And it goes along with the other non linguistic, nonverbal communications, the environment of concern, attentiveness, care, receptivity that you're giving these people and their receptivity to what is going to transpire in their time with you, right? Right. So all this is good. This world that we live in with this, you know, dark music and let me just draw attention to the attire of people today, the dark, <laughs> satanic look of clothing, the, um, I don't even know where to go beyond this. I saw, I put on my blog a video made by Sean Turnbull. It's only 11 minutes and it depicts a building in Brussels that has a piece of quote unquote art on it, which is a naked, decapitated human being tied, hanging, dripping blood. I mean, for God's sake, images like this are disturbing to us. These kinds of images should not populate our world as art because you know what? Fundamentally, they cause you concern. Is this what you want to look at? Human beings without heads, human bodies without heads that are gushing blood? Is this what we want to look at? I mean, this is the very thought of this is designed to work you up in terms of sympathetic nervous system. Right. And every cue, every input around us is becoming increasingly um, satanic, dark, worrisome, driving us into concern and fear. So we don't get enough PNS, parasympathetic nervous system, right? We get too much SNS. Yeah, uh, you know, and it, it just tells us, it reminds us, I should say, that how twisted, very twisted and how very dark and evil the controllers are. I mean, because like you said, they're putting uh, quote-unquote art out, out there like that. I mean, you know, like you said, that's going to be something that's going to be a shock to most uh, normal people. I mean, they're, they're going to look at that and say, well, what is that? It's disturbing, right? But there's, there's a lot of stuff they put out there that is meant to do exactly that. It's to, to disturb us. It's to to take us out of uh, a state of balance or um, 
uh, state of homeostasis. I mean, basically to keep us uneven, to keep us unbalanced, if you will, and to keep us in that fight or flight type of frame of mind. You know, it, God forbid they should ever put stuff out there that would be calming and relaxing and soothing and enjoyable. You know, and I think that's how people have to start looking at this. You know, I, I think that so many folks have been so indoctrinated and so programmed to look at things like that and just believe that that's a natural part of the fabric of of living existence, the culture that, you know, it's, it's dehumanizing humanity. Uh, you know, it's taking us down to the level of a subspecies, if you will. And, you know, I think it's very, very important that people start to recognize these things. Sophia, you know, you, you're example with that statue is, you know, is perfect. Um, because I can tell you there's people that are looking at it, they're very disturbed by it, and there's other people that don't even blink, you know? You might even think it's cool. How many times have I heard something like that whenever something's on TV and it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of bloodshed or murder or whatever. A lot of the kids today will look at that stuff and say, isn't that cool? I'm like, no, that's that's not cool, you know, but that's the society. I mean, really, Mike, I think that our days should be like this. We should be outside, in the sunshine, frolicking around, barefoot, having a good time, talking to each other, laughing, dancing, cavorting, receiving electron transfer, which then is banked in your body. We actually have something that's called, um, it's a gel. It's called, oh my God, now I'm drawing a total blank. And it is a a non-fibrous gel that is the bank fault for electrons. I think it's called ground substance. And our bodies draw electrons from our day time, from other people, from everywhere, even from food. There's something called donatable electrons that comes out of the breakdown of food, which is chiefly where we're getting it now. And it comes from the breakdown of fats and carbohydrates. And this is why people are wolfing fats and carbohydrates like there's no tomorrow. But anyway, in this ground substance, which is an interstitial tissue gel, the body banks electrons. Then you go to sleep when you're all tuckered out and you get into deep restorative sleep and your body does its repairs, its deep restoration processes using these millions and billions of electrons that it's collected all day from your various joyful outdoor activities. And that's how you do cellular repair. But when you're in bed at night and your Wi-Fi router is going all night and your cordless phone and you're recharging your cell phone, and you're sleeping upstairs where where you're removed from the negative electron flow of the earth, how are you going to do restorative work? Yeah. You're going to be in SNS mode again. You're never going to get in true PNS mode where you're breathing very, very deeply. I mean, that should be the day. The day should be being outside, experiencing joy, collecting and trading electrons, and then coming to a restful place during the night and sleeping and repairing. Now the Piraha don't, <laughs> they don't sleep at night because of their poisonous dart frogs and all of that, but they get plenty of electrons and they have worked their rest into short, shorter naps, two hour yeah. sleep periods. Well, you know, it's, we, we are so detached from the way it's supposed to be, you know, and some people will think that I'm living in Never Never Land for believing that uh, we should be living the way you just laid it out. But that's that's the way it's supposed to be. People have to take a look at your lifestyle. I mean, everything is about everything is about worry. Everything is about fear. Everything is about scarcity. It's about going to work. It's about paying bills. It's about doing this and doing that, you know, and so on. You're always run, 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 running. And uh, and like you said, and then you're swimming in a pool of EMF. Your water has fluoride in it. Your drinks have aspartame in it. You're, you're breathing in aerosol spraying. It's it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable the environment. This like this toxic soup that we uh, we exist in. You know, hopefully people will listen to to us and to shows like this, and they'll start to make even the smallest changes in their lifestyle. Sophia, I mean, just changing a couple of things here and there. I'm not expecting the world to be a panacea like tomorrow, but you know, uh, changing diets, uh, getting exercise, uh, getting away from the uh, from the EMF best you can, and things like that. Just making these changes to 
try to get yourself more grounded and get yourself on a better path health-wise, both physically and mentally. So I'm going to end on a good note, all right? Was that too, was that too Debbie Downer? Yes. It scared <laughs> me. I don't know how okay. I ended it before. <laughs> all right. So, Mike, the last part of the newsletter is titled, I won't even say it. I'll just surprise people. All right. So remember we said the Piraha don't have any future tense? Right. Well, nor does English. Verb conjugations exist in other languages for the future. We don't have it in English. We say, I will go or I am going to the airport or wherever. Uh, in other languages, in French, je vais à l'aéroport or j'irai means I will go. So it's another conjugation of the verb to go. Je vais, I go, j'irai, I will go. We don't have that in English. We have to say go with the word will. Now think about it. Every single thing you plan to do, you're going to express with this word will, or I am going to, or I shall, right? I will mop the floor. I will build a doghouse. I will, 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 will. I'm going to. I plan to. These are ways to say it. But every one of those ways contains our intention. Does it not? It does. Right. So what does it really mean? It means that as we in English strategize for the future, it rests on our will and intention. So the creation of the future comes out of our intention. To me, this was extremely noteworthy when I began to think about it. Because in this spirituality, we're taught that our intention is everything. And it's that is in our language, Mike. Right? Yes. So we have, the Piraha, Piraha may have the grammar of happiness and i was thinking actually well if they have the grammar of happiness do we have the grammar of unhappiness considering how unhappy we all are but then i decided no we have the grammar of will we do think about the future and we make it from our will from our intention yeah that was one of the things to be honest with you that kind of bothered me about the Piraha is that uh, that they didn't have a mental state or you know a thought process that went into the future or thought about the future. You know that to me was like, well, there are things to look forward to in the future. As an example, I mean, not everything that you think about in the future is is bad. It's not worry. I mean, sometimes you're planning to do something, right? You're you want to build something. As an example, you want to create something. And you know that um, it's going to be a future state in which maybe, you know, that something's going to get done. As an example, when I did my CD, um, that was something that I planned. It was out in the future. I gave myself a date in the future as to when I was going to finish up. But it was something that was very inspiring and something that motivated me very much to engage in that process. So I think like, you know, not to have that intention or that will or, you know, that, I don't know, just seems like maybe you're missing something, a big piece of what it is to to live life. Well, Mike, you use the word inspire, and inspire means to be charged up toward the future, toward some future eventuality. If the Piraha, I've never been there, never met a single Piraha, I am thinking that if they experience this enormous quantity of joy in the present on a daily basis, because they're always laughing, smiling, joking. They enjoy each other and they enjoy their present life. Then they don't need to be concerned about the future. They don't need to be inspired about something in the future because every day they experience this large amount of joy, which I think also contains a tremendous electron transfer. They're outdoors. They get the transfer from the jo joviality and from the river and the land and all that. So they don't need this inspiration. They don't have to restore a guitar or, you know, um, save up to buy a new TV or they don't have to do any of that. 
They don't yeah. have to do it. So they don't think about doing it. And their existence hasn't changed effectively. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, it's just it's not part of their equation. So it's it's just not there. So if it's not there, you don't focus on it, right? Right. And we we have to plan for the future because we have to get a delivery of this or, you know, I've got to replace my screens and my back door or something. Um, we have to plan. We have to set it up and we have to think about the future. And everything that we express about the future in English has to do with will. I think that's great. So we have a power in our will. It actually casts our future. Our intention casts our future. That's what I thought was pretty cool. We have the grammar of will. It is pretty cool. I, I liked your last sentence. If language charges us with electricity, we must likewise be able to charge the language of our intention. This would be how to create our future. It's great. Very insightful. It was my effort to place myself in a context that was not just all doom and gloom and that we are in our culture are missing something. I mean, the Pirahar were taken by Dr. Everett to Sao Paulo, <laughs> and he took them through the streets of the city, and they could not believe why this rus rush and hustle and bustle. They couldn't. They couldn't identify with any of it. And they asked, why is everybody in such a hurry? And then he took them into a really nice apartment with a lot of expensive furniture. There was a very big, very plush TV set. And then they all sat on the TV. They sat on the TV? Yeah. They thought it was something to sit on. <laughs> they were told to get off. Wait, that's a very expensive TV. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's like I said, it's hard to get your head wrapped around because, uh, you know, they walk in, let's say they walk into a room and there's furniture there. And uh, for the most part, you know, they don't know what that is. I mean, they can maybe surmise that maybe like the TV, this is a place where you sit. They were wrong, but, you know, but but everything in the room is that way, right? I mean, I, I would have to guess that maybe they haven't even seen a lamp, maybe, right? No. Unless um, he brought one and, and showed them or a flashlight or something. But uh, other than that, they wouldn't know what the heck that was. Man, it's just amazing. It's like it's like some like a whole different dimension, you know? And uh, when I was reading your newsletter, it was, it was really, I was kind of getting a little frequency jam, just trying to think about and delineate our culture and what we do and, you know, their culture and how they go about it. I'm like, wow, wow. I mean, it's not even, it's not even, you know, parts of it that are even remotely close. It's, it's completely different, completely different. Yeah, I think it's pretty amazing. I, it's good to remove yourself from the context of where you are and put yourself in a different context. Yeah. Well, it was another great newsletter. I highly recommend people subscribe to it. Well, you're very kind. And again, I have been doing shows with you on the newsletters, but it's a little different to actually receive it. It has all of the um, the the flow that right. these interviews may not quite have. And it is by subscription. And there is a tab on my website that says newsletters. You can read um, samples there and you, it says how to subscribe. There's a little icon that says what you have to send in. And, you know, it comes by snail mail, Mike. This is the thing. I like sending these things by snail mail because that's how people actually start and finish them. And then they keep them. So they have them always to refer to. But if you get something that's like this was 12 pages, a double issue, if you get that in email, you're going to get interrupted and then you're going to forget to finish it. Yeah, I always have to print things out. So even when you send them to me over email, I always print them out. I, I can't read things on the screen, Sophia. It drives me crazy. I have to have hard copy stuff in my hand in order to uh, to read through. Right, and then you can highlight and you can mark things that you could go back to or look up further. So I appreciate the opportunities you give me. And this one was a little bit of a labyrinth, but I hope we started interestingly and ended in a good place, the grammar of will. And um, I just want to thank you, Mike. You're always very patient and curious, and it gives me a chance to discuss out loud what I have written. Well, Sophia, you know that you are always welcome and you can come on the show anytime. You just, 
say when, and we scheduled. Your ability to connect dots is is really amazing to me. So, um, I mean, even putting a newsletter like this together, I mean, it's it's in, basically it's covering three topics. But the way you put the three topics together, they're woven together seamlessly. So anytime, anytime, and you know that. It's always great. I get a lot of great feedback from folks. Uh, they like our conversations. People just tune in and sit back and listen. Now, I, I almost always forget this, though, whenever we have a show. Products from your store, Avatar products, you have new products that you want to talk about or existing products that people should know about? Well, I would like people to try Mrs. Hamilton's household cleaners. One person bought quite a few of them, actually. I was surprised. She was a customer I didn't know at all, personally. But I have sent them to friends, you being one, and people really like them. Now, I want you to understand this, that those products were developed by Mrs. Hamilton, who is someone I know, for Hawaii. Hawaii is a very uh, humid place. And she said she used to have rental condos in Hawaii. She said, everything smells of mold. And this was the only product that she she dreamt it up herself. It's made with vinegar and essential oils and distilled water. And it's, a, it's something you can just spray on your bathroom counter, or kitchen counter, or windows, or just about anywhere you want. And I've cleaned my car with it, just sprayed the dashboard, the steering wheel. It's wonderful. It smells incredible. And she said it's the only thing that doesn't make Hawaii smell like mold. So it took off like crazy in Hawaii. Everybody was buying it by the case to spritz and clean because it, it smells. I carry lemon and lavender. Those are my favorite. I use it in the kitchen. It works great. Thank you. Yeah, no, she'll be pleased. And it comes in this robust glass spray bottle. So that will last a long time. It's sturdy. It's um, I call it the Bilbo Baggins spray bottle. And then you get you can buy the concentrate, which you dilute. So you just use like a, you know, it's a one part to seven parts water. So I want people to try that because Mrs. Hamilton dreamed it up. And we have to stop buying uh, all these, you know, 409 and stuff like that, right? Yeah, even things like seventh generation, Simple Green is a big corporate product and they smell better. And, but this with the essential oils, I think is really, really cool. So I would like people to try that. And another thing that's been selling really well is the magnesium deodorant. People are buying that sometimes three or four at a time. So the magnesium deodorant is a very good seller and it changes the biome in your armpit such that you don't have body odor. You can even skip a day, and it puts magnesium directly. Um, there's lymph in your armpit, so it starts to circulate through your body as a detoxing element. Yes, yes. The magnesium is great. I use that, and uh, also the magnesium cream. It's good, too. It's very good, the 8-ounce pump. All right, well, Mike, thank you for the opportunity. Always love to try to explain my ramblings to you and your listeners who are a great bunch. I appreciate I shouldn't call you bunch because it sounds like a bunch of bananas. Wonderful group of people. I'm very happy to be heard in these ways by all of you, so thank you. Well, you're very welcome, Sophia. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.